Hello, everyone, and welcome to the His Historical Inquirers podcast. I am your host, Ashley Forrest. We are here for those who like to reflect on and analyze past historical events. In this episode, we will be reviewing Harun Mogul's How to Be a Muslim, an American Story. The inquirers I have with me today are Sua Rabba, Selena Namoff, and Andrew Borg. Good evening, everyone, and hello. Hi, Ashley. Hello. Hello. Hi. So we're going to start by just uh, doing a quick review of how to be uh, an American, uh, how to be a Muslim, apologies, an American story, mixed up that title there. Um, so Harun Mogul was thrust into the spotlight after 9-11, becoming an undergraduate leader at a New York University's Islamic Center, forced into appearances everywhere on TV before interfaith audiences in print. Mogul was becoming a prominent voice for American Muslims, even as he struggled with his relationship to Islam. In high school, he was barely a believer and entirely convinced he was going to hell. He sometimes drank. He didn't pray regularly. All he wanted was a girlfriend. But as he discovered, it wasn't so easy to leave religion behind. To be true to himself, he needed to forge a unique American Muslim identity that reflected his beliefs and his personality. How to be a Muslim reveals a young man coping with the crushing pressures of the world that fears Muslims, struggling with his faith and searching for intellectual forebears and suffering the onsite of bipolar disorder. This is a story of the second generation immigrant of what it's like to lose yourself between cultures and how to pick up the pieces. So with all of that being said, uh, I know that as we, we talked uh, before our meeting that this book, details, details, details should be the word, lots of details. Mm -hmm. Let me hear um, your perspectives on how to be a Muslim. And let's uh, let's start off with Selena. Oh, oh yeah, we're gonna, <laughs> that's exciting. How exciting, actually, yay. yay. Um, okay, so my, my initial, my initial feel of the book is if we're talking about somebody's unique story, I don't feel like I experienced the personal narrative of an American Muslim. Um, I feel like if I, if I experienced a cultural personal narrative, it was of somebody dealing with mental health issues. Um, the suicide, the bipolarness, that is the only thing other than you know being into girls that made a consistent appearance throughout the entire book uh he talked about you know trying on different religions and he didn't go very deep and i'm i'm okay with that you know oh well, i really like this but he didn't seem to commit to anything uh based on results he was committed to i don't i mean I'm, I'm not sure what he was committed to. He did really well with his speaking tours and, you know, he's become a figure that still does a great deal of uh, speaking engagements. He's got, I checked, um, an Instagram presence. Uh, you know, he's got some followers, he's doing okay. And he still travels about to speak about Islam, which surprised me because he doesn't seem very confident Every moment when I thought he was about to go really deep into his religion, he jumped and started talking about a philosopher or a religious commentator or somebody that has been long since gone. And I felt mm -hmm. like I was on a roller coaster the whole time. Like, I don't, I don't know that I feel like I got his perspective. Because every time we got really deep, then he instantly jumped to, well, this philosopher, blah, blah. I'm like, stop, where are you going? Where did you come from? What, what is happening right now? And so um, I was connecting a little bit to some of the struggles he had with mental, mental health issues. Um, I experienced some similar things um, in grief and depression with the loss of my father, with the um, losses that I've had in, in the world, but um, I don't feel like I know any better how a Muslim felt in 9-11. I really could have used some more information on that because he didn't go there. Gotcha, and very understandable. Sua? Mm -hmm. 
Thank you, Selena, for that overview. I think um, all of us would agree that we kind of felt the same after reading the book. And I definitely agree with several of your points that you mentioned, Selena. <clears throat> um, I felt honestly like reading the book, like I was on a roller coaster ride in terms of keeping track with what the author, like Haruan, tried to relate to his audience. I know he tried to relate his story, his experience being a Muslim or a Pakistani Muslim in America. He did not even touch upon the cultural component as much as he touched about the kind of Muslim component and even not like the idea, I'm culturally Muslim and I did not get a lot from what he tried to relate to his audience. I got confused several times with also his references back to the glory days of Islam, as he mentioned with uh, all scholars, etc. So at first when like reading this book, it felt that Harun had an identity crisis um, torn. He was torn between his cultural background, his um, just uptight, upbringing um, through his, you know, his parents being that if you um, do not follow what you, you request of you, you're going to fail and we're not going to be happy with you. So I think that did have a toll on his identity as a Muslim within the society, like American societal context. And I think as the book progressed, I think Harun himself was conflicted, conflicted between the religious background, his parents, as I mentioned, wanted him to um, follow versus his own interpretation of Islam. We can see him use the term um, professional Muslim, um, especially um, in the 9-11 chapter, like he understood the religion and he can recite what people want to hear about Islam. I think he wanted to say that I, as a Muslim, do not owe you an explanation and you should not like blame my people, but he did not say that. He did not um, show the empathy um, that I wanted him to show as just a fellow human being to what was happening um, in New York back then. So again, that's where the book, I think, fell short. And also the flashbacks, again, to the glory days of Islam. And he kept going back to Granada, to Cordoba. He was not there. But even when he visited those cities, he um, had, again, it could have to deal with his mental health issues. But he was living in a version of Islam that only existed for a only little um, portion of time. And of course, Islam progressed, Muslims progressed, but he's stuck in that version of Islam. And I felt that he wanted to just be stuck there. Again, in retrospect, after like marinating and kind of wanting to understand more about the book, um, just like the whole title itself um, felt like a little sarcastic. Like how to be a Muslim, like mm -hmm. this is your... Um, like, you know, play by play on how to be a Muslim according to the culture, according to my parents, but not according to my, like himself or his own perspectives. So again, that is the general overview. Um, I'm disappointed. The description at the back of the book was a little bit, mis a lot misleading in terms mm -hmm. of the 9-11 description. Again, I wanted to know more. I think the, that chapter precisely was going somewhere and it fell short in what I wanted to know, again, as a a culturally Muslim person, and again, how his colleagues, like his friends, how did they feel? How did the community feel? That was not shown, sadly, in the book. Like, there's no tra traces of cultural um, communication at all um, in kind of remembering or reminiscing on that horrific event. So that is just my take on the book. <laughs> so uh, thank you. Um, you actually led into what I was going to talk about, which was the description of the book, which the first sentence, as I read in the very beginning, was he was thrust into the spotlight after 9-11, becoming mm -hmm. an undergraduate leader at New York University Islamic Center. That one sentence would make anyone reading the book think that this book was going to be a perspective, a, a Muslim perspective from 9-11. Mm -hmm. I did not get that. Mm -hmm. I got... Um, and I say this with all respect, a wise man, a man who whined. And at, at some point I felt as if I wanted to say, you are a grown man who can make his own decisions. Everyone, uh, no matter the religion, has free will to make their own decisions. Um, and uh, details, lots and lots of details are <laughs> 
missing from this book. What, what we thought was going to be talked about really wasn't talked about. It was hinted upon. Mm -hmm. It was a brief one or two sentences, and then it was gone. Um, I will say I did like his J.R. Tolkien. If you guys do not know who that is, Lord sure. of the Rings, The Hobbit, um, The One Ring, which will be on Amazon uh, Prime. He references, you know, the Arthur. He references Star Trek. He even references Green Day, which was something uh, consistent throughout the book as well. In addition to what Selena mentioned of girls and uh, just uh, in faith. His, his music, and uh, I think that's become part of his identity, was mm -hmm. he compared a lot of things to what he either listened to or what he liked to watch. Um, and that was pretty much it. You know, his mental health was definitely unnerving. The first chapter talks about suicide. Not something you really expect to see as you first start reading. Um, but you can tell that there are also some other issues aside from bipolar that could you you could see but he doesn't reflect on he doesn't really reflect on his physical being of of what he actually had we know it's chronic but that's it we know it's bipolar but that's it there are many forms of bipolar um many forms of how suicide can happen and it's just details, 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 as the Grinch <laughs> says, De details, details, give me details. There are no details at all. Andrew, what do you think? So I I agree with a lot of what you all ha have said already. Um, I know that I, I grew up Jewish. I have not really stayed that way. So I can relate to somebody who feels a little disconnected from their faith at times. The thing that um, I think kind of bothered me the most was that as I was reading the book, I kind of felt like Haroon had formed his own um, sort of personal Islam that may not necessarily, and I don't know for sure, may not have been uh, reflective of greater Islam. And I kind of, I thought back to um, our discussions about the single story and the dangers of the single story. And my disappointment in this book did kind of make me want to read some other Muslim perspectives as well. So I do think there's a silver lining to it. Um, but on the whole, um, yeah, I was a little disappointed. And as for the description on the back of the book, um, I, I also don't know this for sure, but I think it's publishers who usually do that. And it's usually a marketing tactic. So sometimes they try to make things sound a little more exciting than they actually are. Um, and I think that if it, if Haroon had perhaps had a little more control over that, um, then he would have written something that was a little more true to to the text that we all read. Yeah, so are you saying that the book is not exciting, Andrew? <laughs> um, <laughs> bits and pieces were exciting. Um, you know, like I said, th there were um, a few times where I saw a lot of myself in Haroon, so I, mm -hmm. I could relate to some of what he was talking about. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, g given the description, I, I read something that w wasn't what I was expecting, but it did make me want to dig a little deeper and, and see what other Muslim perspectives are out there, because that's definitely uh, an area that I have not explored a whole lot. And uh, definitely I could expand my horizons there and, and become more informed. They are out there. There is. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. Um, so with this. Um, we normally give you know, our perspectives in a, in a second topic. And with the second topic, you know, this is considered our last um, viewing, recording. Um, and so we have gone through quite a few books over the last almost 10 weeks. And to bring it all to a close, not even comparing, but relating one book to another. Um, how would you all say each one, if you could connect one topic that we've discussed all three books, which is um, Discourse on Colonialism, uh, Born a Crime, and How to Be a Muslim, how would you connect, if possible, all three? And, and everyone doesn't have to go, but how would, and that's a little blurry, how would um, each of one of you or everyone connect at least one thing? Well, and let's let's add in pedagogy of the oppressed. Okay. Um, 
because I can, we didn't do a separate podcast on that. However, Mm -hmm. um, that book, I think did a nice job. It actually, because it was the first one we read, it helped me to better understand some of the things in colonialism and border crime. Mm -hmm. Um, Forgive me for what I'm about to say (laughs) is the only real oppression that I experienced in how to be a Muslim is the oppression of the reader. Cause I kept <laughs> looking back in the back going, God, is this almost done yet? The mm. hell? Cause I think in his mind, he was oppressed by his faith, at least as a teenager. But let me tell you something, every teenager feels oppressed mm. by their parents, <laughs> by their faith. Like, Oh no, by the end of the book, I can't hug these girls with these hug me signs because it's against my, like, dude, if you're not hug the girls, hug the girls, get out of your stuff. Um, so I think I have a really hard time putting um, how to be a Muslim, comparing it to the others. And I, it's, I think maybe the best thing I can do is a voice of oppression because it puts me in a place of privilege to say, well, he doesn't feel oppressed. He's not that oppressed. And from his perspective, he may be. And so it's a voice that is worth listening to. However, I I think he was really whiny and I think all teenagers (laughs) a little bit oppressed, but they're not. And we know, you know, do you guys, are you you picking up what I'm saying? Yeah, I kind of. I think I agree. I think another way to look at it is he wasn't directly oppressed by his religion, but Mm -hmm. uh, it was more indirect. His parents were Mm -hmm. uncomfortable having uh, conversations with him about sexuality, Mm -hmm. about how to act when he, um, you know, when he has a crush on somebody. And Mm -hmm. this wasn't related to my faith growing up, but I had conversations with both of my parents about consent, Mm -hmm. about, um, you know, where would be a fun place to take someone on a date? So I, I, you know, I don't think he was explicitly oppressed by Islam, but the way it was more his parents' relationship with Islam that hurt mm-hmm. him in the long run and maybe stunted his development, uh, the development of his identity a little bit. And all of his illnesses, mental yes. and physical. Mm-hmm. Exactly. Um, and I definitely agree with your point, um, especially... Andrea, like regarding like talking to family and how it plays into the single narrative. I mean, you can see that he has like smart responses. He talks back. Like when he was at NYU, he wanted to change the play, like the playing game. He wanted to have more um, women vice presidents. He had that open mindedness that I kind of appreciated. But at the same time, I was disappointed by him not questioning his parents to an extent. Like, okay, you said so and so about religion, but as a teenager I remember myself again growing up in a cult in a Muslim household or a kind of interfaith household um and trying to question like this does not make sense to me make it make sense and I did not see that I did not see his relationship to his family it was more it fell flat and it did not evolve at all throughout the book and I'm not sure if he basically that was basically because he was a single child or the only child technically at home and his brother was away he did not have that other support system that is from the same age or generation but again as a single as a person who read for scholars and was well read he never questioned um, the narrative his parents kind of relayed on to him. And again, I, I felt uncomfortable in that specific portion for him specifically, not exploring that further. I can definitely see uh, each each point. Um, the one thing that just actually came to my mind, I actually was gonna let you guys have the, the floor with the topics, um, double life. Mm-hmm. I just, yeah. it, it just hit as I was looking at the books, he, almost had a double life Mm -hmm. because he had his life of being what his parents sort of wanted in a way of not talking to girls, not doing this, not doing that, not doing sex sex education and all of that, wanting to be the modern, but then also wanting to be the modern Muslim. Mm -hmm. It was almost like leading a double life. And that, Mm -hmm. that's where it's almost like you can see the polarity of bipolarism, depending Mm -hmm. on what type he had, come through but at the same time trevor was leading a double life at one point discourse on colonialism oppressors and oppression uh, and the oppressed 
um, discourse on colonialism and pedagogy of the press even talked about double lives mm -hmm. of living in duality of trying to get out to one while you're still living in the other. And I definitely now see that with Haran Mogul is he was trying to get out of one life, didn't really know how to get out of it, but he was also living mm -hmm. a whole nother uh, life, sort of almost like personality um, per se. And that just came up. I don't know how that came up in my mind, but it did. And I was like, mm -hmm. huh, mm -hmm. all right, that's a good way to- Totally accurate, yep. Yeah, yeah tie them all in. Um, before we close, does anyone else have any lasting thoughts? It has been a pleasure being a historical inquirer alongside yes. you wonderful, smart people. Likewise. Likewise, yes. for sure. So with that uh, wonderful last note from Mr. Borg, uh, we know that uh, How to Be a Muslim is an American story. Uh, it's almost 300 pages and available on Amazon. And that is our time. We have come to an end. Uh, I do want to thank Sua, Andrew, and Selena uh, for coming onto the show uh, to review uh, every single book that we have come across. And a special thank you to go out to our listeners, the podcast for inquirers to listen as we reflect on past historical events. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you.